very, very warm welcome and a hello to the, this first ever Ideas Exchange. Um, and my name is Richard and I'm the Chief Executive of Always Possible. And we are delighted to be working in collaboration with the Coastal West Sussex Partnership um, on a number of these Ideas Exchanges over the next year or so. And as I say, this is number one, so it's great to have you all on board and there is no better or more pressing subject to be covering. Um, so we are focusing on business and climate action this afternoon, and we have some terrific speakers and I know we're going to have a terrific conversation. So a little bit of housekeeping first, just before I, uh, I bring in Caroline from Coastal West Sussex and our panellists. Um, so this Although this is set up as a Zoom meeting, uh, we're treating it as a webinar. Um, so all I ask is, it is absolutely fine if you want to have your cameras on, but please just remain muted throughout the conversation. Um, there'll be plenty of opportunity to ask questions. If you, if you have a burning question as you're hearing people talk, then just pop that in the, the chat bar and we'll make sure that we get time to cover it. Um, but there'll also be some, some time at the end. Um, there will be breakout rooms as well. So on three occasions, you're gonna be talking to one another and deliberating over some questions. So it will be interactive, um, but I just ask people keep on mute for now. Um, so this, as I said, is a, is a collaboration led by um, the Coastal West Sussex Partnership, um, a business-led economic partnership working closely with local authorities to uh, improve the coastal economy. And when we talk about the coastal West Sussex Strip, we mean from Fishersgate all through to, to Chichester, um, running along the, the West Sussex coastline, a haven of innovation and opportunity, um, but uh, doesn't always get shouted about so loudly. So that's what we're really excited to be exploring through these sessions. But if you're based out of that area, then you're still very welcome. Um, we want to, to hear your voices in this as well. Um, the meeting is being recorded. So if you don't want to appear on camera, um, then keep your camera switched off. Um, but, uh, but otherwise, we, unless we hear from you, we're, we're gonna assume that your consent is given for that. Um, so I'm gonna introduce our uh, brilliant Speak, speakers for this afternoon in a moment. But first of all, um, Caroline, tell us a little bit more about the Coastal West Sussex Partnership and why we're doing these ideas exchanges together. Yeah, thanks, Richard. And thanks, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. Yeah, as Richard said, we're, we're a business led group and we try and bring the voice of business into the policy and investment decisions. Um, that actually impact on our coastal economy and today's really part of that start of the conversation we we had a kickoff meeting back in October we're now looking to sort of move this further forward and really the aim of the workshop today is to try and identify some of those real practical and tangible actions and interventions that will support our business community move along that road to reducing their carbon emissions. So I'm hoping for a really interactive session today. We've got some, you know, we want a lot of work from you. It's not just a, a sit and listen to a workshop today. It's very much an information um, gathering session. And the, the work that we do from today will be fed back to a session with our MPs and uh, lo local stakeholders and senior leaders towards the end of January. So we're moving um, you know, at some pace to try and really make a difference across our coastal economy. So that's all I want to say for now. I'll hand back over to Richard and he can introduce our, our speakers for today. Thank you, Caroline. Um, you know, and I'm excited about being involved in this as the, the leader of, of a West Sussex small business. Um, uh, although we, you know, we, we tackle lots of um, different thorny issues and conversations through our work. This is the one that I admit I know the least about. I have the, 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 the fewest number of clues about really where to start. What's the difference between carbon neutral and net zero? These are things that are keeping me up at night. Um, so I'm, I'm here, though I'm facilitating, I'm also here as, uh, you know, somebody who's, who's very open to learning. And I'm very excited about the, the panellists that we've got because our conversations already have, have taught me a lot. Um, so, you know, what we're focusing on is, is what is preventing businesses from reducing their carbon emissions? What are the barriers and the blockers for small businesses to really embrace what we now are talking about as an emergency? Uh, it's, a, it's a crisis. And I think that consensus around that is, is pretty unanimous. Um, COP26 showed us actually how far we still need to go. Um, and, and as businesses, how do we how do we map that against um, meeting the bottom line and, and keeping going, particularly in these um, economic uncertain times. 
So the aim of this workshop, we just want to hear practical, tangible interventions, things you're trying, things you want to know more about, and our speakers are going to be um, putting some provocations and thoughts out there, which is, which is hopefully going to help aid that conversation. So I'm, I'm going to introduce the four uh, guests today. Um, we've got Sam Zendel, co-MD of Propellernet, um, search marketing legends, but uh, also Sam is leading the change um, through our understanding of net zero. Um, and he's going to be talking in a moment about um, a survey he's done, and we're going to get some, some, some results on that. Um, Sam, did you want to just give a little flavor of your work and, and, and certainly the, uh, the, the leadership group that you've set up, and then um, I'll introduce the others after. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Caroline. Yeah, it's great to be here today. Um, so as Richard said, my name's Sam Zindel. I'm co-MD of a digital marketing agency based in Brighton called Propellinet. Um, we've been pioneering climate action as a business for the last 18 months or so. So I've been on a bit of a, a journey as a business leader with it. Um, and in the last six months, I've set up an initiative called Low Carbon Leaders. Um, that initiative is designed to inspire, engage and support other businesses, in particular SMEs, on their journey towards net zero and beyond. Um, so through that um, initiative. Ooh, we've lost you, Sam, but thank you for that. I think we've got the gist yeah, and we'll come, back to you. Oh, we'll come back to you shortly um, uh, to discuss the survey, but uh, thank you. Sorry, we lost you there for a second, but um, I'm gonna introduce now Zoe Osmond. Um, many many uh, locally will know Zoe for, for her work in, the uh, Universities of Brighton's um, Green Growth Platform, but uh, more recently has been working on a national stage um, as the Director of Clean Growth UK. Zoe, give us a little overview of your work. Hi everyone, thanks for inviting me. So my name's Zoe Osmond, I'm Director of Clean Growth UK and we're a university-led green business innovation network. And we have hubs at the Universities of Brighton, which is Green Growth Platform, our regional hub, and then at the Universities of Portsmouth and Liverpool, John Moores. And our, our main mission aim is to support companies in the transition to net zero through helping them to innovate the products and services that we need for a low carbon sustainable future. And also to then commercialize those products and services, take them to market. And we do that by helping them through our specialist academic facilities and expertise. We're just um, developing a new service area, which is on target to net zero, to help SMEs on that three-step journey um, to reducing their, their footprint and to, you know, to taking the, the journey to net zero, potentially, finally, the last stage via offsetting. So I'll say a little bit more about that later on, yeah. but really pleased to be here. Fantastic. Thank you, Zoe. Yeah, we're going to explore that in much more depth and look at um, business networks and, and the support out there, which... Um, many people still uh, don't know enough about yet. So that's fantastic that you're here, thank you. Um, uh, and then Adam Hutley, founder and managing director of, of Red Inc. Uh, I've uh, been learning a lot about Red Inc in the last few weeks and the extraordinary revolution in the office supply industry that you're uh, spearheading. So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, good to be here today. So um, I'm the founder of Red Inc. Um, I set the company up in 2008, which uh, seems like a lifetime ago now, to be quite honest with you. And we had the aim of um, challenging the sort of standard industry model. Um, and by that, what we wanted to do is look at new ways of doing business that were less wasteful, more ethical, and ultimately more environmentally focused. Um, and the sort of the main underlying reason for this was that we wanted everyone to, to benefit, so all stakeholders, so our clients, our staff, and the planet. Um, and the great thing about today is this concept of sharing ideas. And I can't stress how important that's been for us over the years. But we also want to inspire other companies to embrace more sustainable practices and by highlighting the benefits that come from it. Uh, and as we've proved, I think, as a company, um, is that firstly, it's possible to transition towards net zero as a micro or even an SME and see real tangible benefits from it. Um, and also to reassure people here as well that there's just so much help now. Uh, and once you get going, you'll find that there's loads of people around you to support you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to um, hear from you later and, and look at the, you know, how that stance is actually giving you a, a business advantage. And um, 
that we need to see all of this work not as a burden but as a an opportunity so that's uh, going to be great later thank you very much and then um, lastly but certainly not leastly and I'm going to start with a congratulations as roadway roadways were named company of the year at the Sussex Business Awards last week which is a fantastic achievement um, but, uh, but to introduce James Bailey um, chief executive of roadways uh, many many years in telecoms took a big leap of faith to, to buy a civil engineering company and now you're trying to decarbonize concrete all over the world it's it's some journey tell us a little bit about that thanks richard yeah good afternoon everyone yeah so i'm james from roadways uh, we're a highways maintenance and civil engineering contractor we work across east sussex west sussex uh, down to southampton and uh, construction and the built environment is responsible for 40 percent of carbon emissions globally uh, so there's a massive role that uh, construction and building can play and, and uh, you as business people operate, oper operate customers, clients for those things, local authorities uh, and concrete alone, uh, as we, thanks for the introduction Richard, is responsible for 8% of global carbon emissions. So yeah, we've been doing lots of good stuff around, around that and uh, innovation and I look forward to talk to you about that bit more in a second. Fantastic. Thank you, James. Um, as, as you all agree, an, another great topic for us to delve into in terms of innovation and, and, and the future of all of this. Brilliant. So um, I'm now going to bring Sam back, uh, who's been doing some um, fantastic work asking some, some questions of all of us locally around what we think about this and what our challenges and barriers are. Um, what were your findings, Sam? Um, thanks, Richard. Yeah, and apologies for my dropping connection. Um, I'm not sure how much of my introduction you heard, but just to answer Esther's question. Well, we, we lost now. a couple of questions, uh, seconds, that's all. Okay, fine. So yeah, like Low Carbon Leaders um, actually collaborated with um, Caroline and, and Coast of West Sussex to commission a business net zero survey for Sussex businesses. Um, and we have now got the results of that survey. And so I'm going to spend just about five minutes or so running through the headlines of the survey findings now. Um, so I will just share my screen with everybody. Um, let me know that everyone can see that. Is that good, Richard? Yeah, excellent. Okay, so um, it was, yeah, a, a, a survey that was really designed with this session in mind to try and help us better understand what the needs are of our local community of businesses, uh, in particular, sort of small and medium sized businesses. Um, so the four, four goals of, of conducting the survey really is to better understand the level of knowledge around the term net zero and what it means um, and understand how important business felt net zero and the climate agenda was for their business. Um, any steps that have been taken already uh, and then any support that might be needed to accelerate net zero transition and action. So with those four uh, goals in mind, we put together a very simple 10 question survey. It was only five minutes of people's time to, to um to enter and here are some of the findings. So um, first and foremost, 71% of uh, respondents um, said that they at least understood what net zero meant to different degrees. Um, so it was encouraging to feel that the terminology of net zero has landed now in the majority. I think you only need to go back probably 12 months and it was it was a peculiar term that people weren't quite sure how to, how to um, understand it. Um, and actually even more than that, over, over three quarters of the respondents um, answered the question about how important they felt net zero was for the business as it was important. So from an engagement perspective, it feels like, you know, we've made some great progress in terms of the, um, mainstream business leadership, recognizing this as part, something that's relevant to them. Um, when you delve a bit deeper to find out, okay, well, what have people done with that important, uh, you know, how, how, prior, how much of a priority is net zero um, being taken as in our Sussex business community? 80% um, of the companies that answered the survey have not measured their carbon footprint or set a carbon emissions reduction target. And I suppose those two points are linked because it's very hard to set a target without knowing um, what you're measuring and, and how you might reduce it. So that was quite telling because that often this is the first thing if you follow anything like the UN Race to Zero or Together for Our Planet Central Government Initiative, measuring a carbon footprint is often seen as the first thing to do. There's reasons why that, that should or shouldn't be the case in different sectors, but um, ultimately I do think it's an important step at some point to take to get a full handle on where the carbon emissions exist in your business and therefore what you're going to do about reducing them. Um, despite not measuring carbon footprint, 58%, uh, not everyone measuring their carbon footprint, 58% of businesses have already say they've taken steps to reduce their carbon emissions. So they're not reducing it against a benchmark, but they are taking steps that they believe are helping the planet. Um, and that's over the last 12 months. But interestingly, when we asked a, a secondary question in this part of the survey, what, what have you done? A lot of these companies have referenced things like um, energy supply 
and business travel as two examples where they've relooked at their policies. Um, but very few have referenced anything that we might class as supply chain um, work. So looking at purchase goods and services. And actually, I know firsthand as a service sector business, having had our carbon footprint measured in quite some detail, that nearly 90% of the carbon emissions of our agency live in purchase goods and services. So it, it's the biggest area for most businesses to tackle, yet um, it doesn't feel like many businesses are, are either seeing it, so they don't have the information to show that, or that it's just not a not a priority at the moment to, to address. Um, so that's one, one interesting um, figment of the results here. Um, the other thing I was interested in finding out is, is about carbon offsetting. Um, so, you know, net zero involves only a very small amount of uh, offsetting residual emissions, perhaps only five or 10% of your emissions is, is now allowed um, to be able to class yourself as net zero. However, in the short term, um, achieving carbon neutrality, so balancing the amount of emissions that you emit with the emissions that you're actually drawing down through credible offset schemes, I thought it might be more widely taken up, but actually 85% of businesses we surveyed are not investing at all in any carbon offsets. So there's clearly um, no action being taken in this area, um, not, not just not measuring your comfort, but also not thinking that offset as a short-term solution um, is widely taken up. That was proved to not be the case with the um, businesses that we surveyed. Um, and just finally, um, we asked, I put the full results in this, these were the full options, because I wanted you to be able to see a bit more detail about this question about if you could have support provided to your business to help your transition to net zero, tick any of the below or what's on the screen now that you think would be most helpful. Um, and so really just to summarise, you know, that the number one thing that businesses in our area have been uh, keen to ask for is funding and grants to, to help their business become more eco-friendly. Um, the next two highest uh, categories um, exist around that measurement of carbon and understanding your carbon footprint and also recommendations for how to reduce their footprint as a secondary uh, item knowledge and training which could be around science-based targets uh, as well as just understanding the fundamentals and finally innovating and collaborating was seen as the least needed support but i'm, I'm quite fascinated by this um because i think collaboration is actually one of the most important things to be doing at this time, particularly in people uh, within your own sector. I mean, I've got first-hand experience of working with direct competitors over the last year. Um, so just to quickly summarise, basically, uh, um, you know, if you want the real headlines of this, our Sussex business community, the, the, the respondents that we receive broadly understand net zero and believe it's important, um, but only 20% of them know their carbon footprint and um, many of them are taking action already, over half. Um, very few are offsetting. Um, and they believe that funding, measuring their footprint and recommendations for reduction are the, are the biggest support factors that we can help provide for them. Thank you very much. Um, a quick question from me before I, I take others. You've had your head in this game for a little while, particularly from the perspective of, a, of an SME that's, that's, that's really trying to embrace this. Anything in these results that surprised you? Do you, were, you were you expecting um, a different outcome? Uh, no, not nothing massively surprised. I think the offset stat surprised me a little because I thought a lot of businesses might be at the very least offsetting business travel. I think that's something that many companies have done for years now. Um, so it surprised me that so few actually took that uh, answer as as as, uh, as offsetting um, as part of their strategy. Um, we know that offsetting isn't the long term solution, and net zero requires aggressive um, emission reduction, and that's really the core component of what net zero means. Um, but in the short term, it's interesting that companies haven't even engaged in what could be seen as the sort of um, easy option. Um, so that was a little bit surprising. Um, I think the the lack of knowledge around scope three and purchase goods and services and, and needing to work incredibly hard in quite a complex area um, is, isn't surprising, but is quite um, thought provoking because I know as a, that's what we're doing at the moment. And we're obviously a little ahead of some of the businesses that answered the survey, but it is quite it is quite complex and it does involve collaboration and it involves conversations and a bit more resource in order to do it, to work with your, your supply chain. Um, but really tellingly, I think one of the opportunities of net zero is that your business is part of someone else's supply chain. And so understanding that process is actually quite a key learning because um, you're, you're in many other businesses carbon footprint as, as part of their purchase goods and services. You know, all, our, all of our businesses, everyone represents, on this called carbon footprint as well as their own 
So it's quite a key thing to get your head around. Um, so I think there's much work to be done next year around that particular topic. Absolutely. And uh, we've got to talk to each other better. I mean, you know, there may be people in the supply chain who are doing extraordinary work, but, uh, you know, aren't necessarily communicating that back up. So, as you know, as you said at the start, how, how do we know what we're improving if we don't really have the benchmark sort of figure uh, to start with? And, and, and that's one of the biggest challenges um mm -hmm. interesting the, the, the point that you you raised there about net, net zero versus carbon neutrality i think that's a really really key distinction net zero being some 90 percent uh you know of having 90 percent of emissions completely eradicated within then 10 percent offset versus carbon yeah. neutrality which is a bit more this, barren this isn't common knowledge at the moment <laughs> i think that the definition of net zero up until about a month ago has been reduce your carbon footprint or and emissions by as much as possible and then offset the bit that you can't um reduce well it's time to come back um jill asks how many took part in the survey i think it was around 50 just over 50. um so uh you know not it's, it's not everybody but it's uh it's it's enough that we can um, draw some conclusions sam i think you're i think you're back um question from mark do you know of anyone who's had success in influencing their supply chain? Um, <laughs> good question. Well, influencing is a, a, a quite a, a, a poignant word. Um, I mean, we've we've spoken to our top ten carbon emitters as a supply chain, and ultimately not dealt them an ultimatum, but basically said that over the next year we're reviewing our entire supply network, and if um, if you can't align to a net zero target or demonstrate what you're doing then we will move our business elsewhere. Um, but with that, we've also said we will help you because we've been through this ourselves. And so we're very happy to give you the principles and some of the models you might use to measure your carbon footprint and recommendations for where to go for that information. So um, I, I know that large organizations are now often putting in their procurement process the need to demonstrate a science-based net zero target in order to qualify for a tender. And in fact, the UK government say that all of their contracts now include that as part of their policy. I think some of the local councils they might be on the call today are, are beginning to adopt that um, as well. At least at least I think one of the response requirements is your sustainability um, sort of policy as a business, if not a science-based target, which is a slightly harder version of the same thing. Um, so I think what we're going to see increasingly is that companies that want to work with larger organizations are, are having to prove um, that they are on the pathway to net zero just to get the invitation to pitch for a contract that's fantastic sam really helpful uh insight to share there thank you um so i'd now like to reintroduce zoe osman from uh, clean growth uk can you tell us a little bit more then <clears throat> um about the work the innovation networks and, and the support for businesses that that, you, that you're spearheading yeah absolutely i'm going to do a screen share if that's okay i've got a, a short presentation okay Okay, brilliant. Um, hi, everybody. Again, my name is Zoe Osmond, and our network is Clean Growth UK. We're part of the University of Brighton, as I said, and our regional network is Green Growth Platform, which I hope some of you have heard about. Uh, and we have our other hubs at Universities of Portsmouth and Liverpool, John Moores. Um, as I said, we're principally, we, our roots basically when we started from 2014 were in a, as an innovation network helping companies to tap into our university expertise and facilities to innovate and commercialise the products and service we need for um, net zero transitions to a sustainable economy. Uh, but we're now developing this new service around net zero on, on target to net zero, which I'll tell you about in a sec. Um, so this probably echoes some of the things that Sam has said. Uh, as an SME, why do we need to act? Um, well, the obvious answer is to ensure a, a, a future safe life on Earth for ourselves, for our children, grandchildren, for the, the species, the plants and animals on our planet. We all need to reduce our emissions rapidly. Um, as a world, we have to re reduce our carbon emissions by 50% by uh, 2030, and with, they're still currently increasing. So we've got a huge, huge mountain to climb very, very quickly. Um, together with governments, public sector, individuals and businesses, both large and small, we need to all work together to reduce our emissions, to hit the, our, our targets of obviously net zero by 2050, but more importantly, in the shorter term, very, very steep reduction, so 78% reduction by 2035 in the UK, 
we need to work together on this. So as, as Sam mentioned, the government now requires suppliers to have um, credible carbon reduction in plans for any tenders over 5 million. And it's very likely that those tender thresholds will be lowered. Um, but perhaps more importantly for SMEs and smaller SMEs, it's, it's about customers. So increasingly, whether it's business customers or, or consumers, they're going to be demanding clarity on your carbon footprint, your, your uh, plans to get to net zero. Um, and as Sam said, we're all part of other people's supply chains. So what we'll find increasingly is that companies without clear environmental net zero policies are going to find it harder not only to sell into their supply chains, but also to recruit uh, staff that really want to work with them and, and want to espouse their values. Um, given that eight in 10 uh, percent, eight in 10 people are either very or fairly concerned about climate change. So I think what's happened over the past few years is the awareness has just mainstreamed. Um, so what can you do as an SME? Well, I think um, Sam said it when he said collaboration is so, so important. Um, so networks are really key here. And I think moving to a net zero business model um, whether that's going on your own net zero journey or whether it's innovating green, clean uh, products and services for your customers, it's not easy. It's a really tricky and difficult thing to do. Um, and as an SME, particularly towards the smaller end, you might well find that you don't have all the resources, um, all the expertise, all the knowledge, all the, the funding that you need in-house to be able to do that. And that's really where the networks come in. So there's a, there's a vast array of um, expertise and, and um, knowledge available through these networks. Um, and if you can tap into that, you can tap into not just knowledge and expertise, but also some real concrete and practical support to help you to reduce your impact, to help you to innovate, um, and to help you to grow your businesses in a sustainable way. Funding is obviously key. So the networks can be a great route to sources of information and support on getting funding, whether that be grant funding or investment, private sector investment. Um, and also, I think the ability to connect with other like minded businesses, with other sources of information, expertise and knowledge and to be able to collaborate with your peers. They may be your competitors, as, as Sam mentioned, you know, collaborating with uh, com their competitors. Um, networks are the way you're going to do this. If you're going to try and do it on your own, chances are you'll struggle. Reach out, there's a lot of support there. So I'm now going to walk you through some of the main networks and supports for SMEs that we have in our in the West Sussex, coastal West Sussex area. Um, so shout out for my own network, which is Green Growth Platform. Um, as I say, we've been delivering services since 2014 to our network. We've now got over 2000 members um, mainly SMEs, but also large companies and some public sector. Um, so what we'll do is we'll understand your innovation journey and we'll link you into university ac academic expertise and facilities, specialist um, expertise across a, a whole variety of subjects from engineering, digital, life sciences, businesses, business, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, to help you to um, carry out R&D for, for new or improved products and services which have positive environmental impact. Um, we'll help you to take those products and services to market through our Clean Growth Fast Track with commercialization support, investment readiness support, um, and then we'll help you with a range of workshops on many business, many different business topics from marketing sales to IP protection, um, etc. Through the network, we can provide you with lots of support on funding, um, grant funding, but also investment funding as well. And we're about to launch a new service. This will be first quarter of 2022. Um, and that's based on this rising um, demand and interest in the journey to net zero. Um, so it's gonna be called on, on target to net zero. And really it's a recognition that a lot of the sort of tools out there um, don't particularly do much hand-holding with the SMEs and some of them are also not going into so much detail on scope three. So what we're developing with On Target to Net Zero is basically a carbon accounting uh, tool which will address scopes one, two and three. So the supply chain, uh, which as Sam said, can be up to 90% of your carbon footprint. 
Um, so that will help you to understand what your carbon footprint is, to quantify your carbon footprint. Um, and then we'll help you to, to go onto that journey of, of reducing your footprint, deciding which are the best in interventions for you to do that, to reduce it down as far as you can. Um, and we'll be offering some workshops so that you can understand the background to all of this stuff, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, what needs to be done across the three different scopes, how you can use our tool, how you can use other tools to help you on that. Um, and we'll also be providing some wraparound support via student projects and a peer-to-peer -peer platform uh, linked, to our, linked to our tool. Um, Net Zero Pledge, which we can help you to track every year to see whether you're on target for those science-based targets um, and some extra support for ho hopefully by um, co coaching and uh, email support. So um, if you join our network, Clean Growth UK, you will be sent a regular newsletter which will update you on when we are about to launch this service. Um, the other main um, funding support that we're running is called Low Case, Low Carbon Across the Southeast. And we're really pleased to work with West Sussex County Council who are co-funding as a strategic partner. Um, it's funding originally from the European Union and our, our lead partner in the project is actually Kent County Council, but we're delivering in this area. And as an SME, you can get up to 10K grant for installing energy efficiency measures in your business. And that's for any sector SME. If you're particularly in a low carbon or green sector, you can also get funding for growth and innovation as well as uh, energy efficiency. So get in touch about that and we can help you. And I think uh, Roadways actually had a, had a, a low case grant fairly recently, so they can tell you more about it. So what other support is available? Um, which has a particular green focus in our area um, and nationally. So there's, there's three sort of main national tools that you can tap into. And I've put links in this document. You'll be circulating the document afterwards so you can click through. Um, there's the SME Climate Hub, which is um, run by the government and also linked into the international science-based targets movement. There's the British Chambers Net Zero Hub. And there's also the Carbon Trust Carbon Foot footprint calculators. They're all great tools. Uh, they've all got different sort of um, aspects and limitations or strengths to them. So it's always worth having a play and seeing if anything sort of jumps out at you. Um, in terms of funding, um, to complement our low case grant funding I just mentioned, uh, Brighton Energy Co-op are offering some funding also through European Regional Development Fund originally, which is community solar accelerator grants. And you can get grants for um, solar PV panels and also for EV charging. So again, the links there, you can click through once you get these slides. Um, the government still has a workplace charging scheme grant in place. So it's another option for you there. Um, and if you're interested in getting in touch with consultants who can help you on your net zero journey, um, we have a directory, Clean Growth UK um, membership directory, and we've got quite a lot of consultants in there who can help you with environmental management or carbon footprinting, if that's what you're looking for. Um, and obviously Sam mentioned the Low Carbon Leaders Network and, and all the um, great work that they do. So you can you can um, check out their Facebook page as well, the link's there. Thank you. So in terms of general support, um, not just green sector, a great place to go is West Sussex County Council uh, Business West Sussex pages. And that really lists comprehensively support available to businesses in the area and it does include a section on low carbon and green business support which basically lists everything I've mentioned above um, with a few little extra bits and pieces um, but just to finish you know I think don't forget chambers and business associations I think even if they don't have that particular low carbon or green expertise it's a great way to meet local like-minded businesses so obviously we've got Sussex Chamber, Gatwick Diamond Business, Business Association and the town chambers um, so do you know network network it's, it's a really great way to make contact and collaborate um, just to, to let you know there's a great way of getting in touch through our website and you can join for free at our Clean Growth UK um, homepage Thank you so much, Zoe. What a, a brilliantly comprehensive and really rich uh, directory of, of, of things that people can tap into and get involved with immediately. Um, um, I'm, I'm conscious of uh, time and I, and I want us to finish on time today. So I'm, I'm going to um, move ahead quite quickly, if that's OK, um, to our first breakout group. Um, and, I, and what I invite you to do is to uh, chat amongst yourselves for, for 
six or seven minutes thinking about what do you see as your main barrier to reducing carbon emissions and transitioning to net zero? You've heard uh, from the survey results, some of the, the, the things that people, you know, maybe aren't, aren't quite getting their heads around yet. Um, but you've also heard from Zoe there about some of the huge opportunities available um, that, that could be helping people overcome this. So um, we really want to know what you think your main challenges are. Um, and as Caroline said earlier, everything that we're discussing today and capturing is gonna be put forward to decision makers, funders, MPs, um, in the new year. So um, to do be frank and open and, and as honest as you can, it'd be really helpful. Um, so we're going to go into breakout rooms now. You will have uh, a facilitator with you who's going to help um, capture two key headlines and then we'll, we'll, we'll join each other back again and, and hear uh, what you've all come up with. So um, Annie Marie, okay to put people into groups now? Welcome back, welcome back. Sorry to, uh, to cut short your conversations, which I know will have been extremely... Uh, uh, in, intense and interesting. Um, we, uh, we've we got so much to cover today though, um, but you will be going back into your groups a couple of other times, so uh, you'll you'll get a chance to reconnect. Um, be great to hear from the, the facilitators in each of the rooms, so from, from Steph, from Sam and from Caroline, just uh, a summary of the key headlines. What was coming out of your room, Stephanie? Yeah, uh, we were fortunate to have Adam there who gave some, some great insight on his journey. But um, two main points, um, it's knowing where to start. It's a complete minefield for a lot of companies, whether you're small, bigger, it's it's just knowing where to start and having the resources to, you know, Zoe's already touched on um, some forums and areas where you can speak to people. So yeah, it is just that. That's a real barrier for a lot of companies. But also, um, Toby Buckle made a very good point in our group. What has the biggest impact? You know, what is that? Can you quantify what that is? It's, um, you know, he talked about international travel, but also, you know, doing a Zoom call, it doesn't have a zero effect. You know, the servers that are generating a lot of power. So, you know, it's trying to quantify exactly what that impact is. So they were the main points really. But also, um, you know, Adam very kindly said back in 2008, when he first started and set up Red Inc., there wasn't the resources that are available so you know he's he's done he's done a lot of work and you know he he's shown to people that it can be done but fortunately people are in a much stronger position time is against us but there's much more resource out there great so, yeah. thank you and it is it's very difficult to know where to start but but the answer i guess is somewhere and uh, and there'll be and there'll be people that, that that can can share their journeys which will inspire as as has been pointed out brilliant thank you sam um what, what did your group come up with in terms of the main barriers yeah um if my connection cuts out anthony will pick up the microphone on my behalf um so um yeah a, a mixture of things really we talked a little bit about energy and travel there's two kind of core areas of carbon emissions that needed considering um travel is an interesting one because the pandemic's forced us into new ways of working and that's actually helped to some degree, uh, you know, mainstream adoption of video calls. Um, but also there is always a need to meet some people and, and how best to achieve that beyond the local area was a question that came up. Um, I think really where we ended up focusing most of our time on was talking about procurement and, and the purchasing of goods and services. Um, Anthony pointed out that now he's working at the Big Lemon and engaging for the first time in sort of public sector um, contracts that such little weighting is given to sustainability and social impact credentials less than five percent in the decision that it's not really setting the right sort of policy really that that the, you, I think if the public sector area is looking like that we can't easily leap to private sector should be up weighting that to 50 percent of the decision do you know what I mean so there's kind of a, a slight misalignment between the ways that procurement is handled and what we need from a net zero starting point. And the final point around procurement for us is also thinking about, Louisa mentioned that tier two supply chains is something that isn't really talked about very much and it's hard to get information on. So who's supplying your suppliers and how does that impact um, your business is another key question. I guess there has to be a line that stops somewhere. And I think your direct supplier relationship might be the core one to focus on. And then it's up to them to work. Fill in, fill in the gap there, but I, I, I think we got uh, okay. the gist of that. Um, thank you, Sam. Caroline. Hi, I think, uh, well, we started off the conversation with, I think, the, the main barriers that have been talked about in the past, which is around time, lack of funding and those clear directives. I think where, where we moved to, I think um, 
uh, one of the the guys on the call, Paul Nord uh, from Nordell, was saying about you know every every company will need to investigate how they look to reduce their carbon emissions. And actually, instead of each company doing that investigations, once those once you've identified what those main barriers are, then you collaborate and you work together to resolve them. And uh, rather than each company having to go through that process, because some companies will have a common um, barrier to reducing their emissions, but how do you work better to collaborate and that needs to be confidential as well so you know it can't just necessarily be open because there'll be a competitive advantage but there must be a way about we can, how we share that information across companies um to actually reduce carbon emissions but without um being a, a competitive disadvantage it's a really really great point and i think you know looking at the vaccination rollout and what we've learned recently is you know in, in, until we're all safe none of us are and i think it's applying that to this issue as well and understanding that you know every business needs to be and every household and every sector has to embrace this fully otherwise those those we all fall into those big gaps and holes so um that's a great point thank you very much um to the three of you and for everybody for for contributing into that we'll take those points forward into the the new year session as as discussed um so now without further ado i'd like to to bring adam hutley from Red Inc uh, to the to the center stage um, to give us a little bit more uh, insight into into that business advantage and how uh, as a B Corp and, and as a, an organization going a bit against the grain in your sector, how you've actually used that to to power your you know your growth as well. Yeah, thanks very much. <clears throat> so um, leading on from my introduction, I, I sort of want to stress that I'm, I'm not um, from a sustainability background. Um, we were talking about that in the group just a minute ago, and I think it's important to say that because it's one of these perceived barriers um, of why people don't get started. But looking back, I think I had one big advantage, and that was that from day one, I just wanted my company to be better, not just bigger. I had a real desire to do things differently uh, and challenge everything that had gone before us. And because our focus wasn't just solely on profit, I think it allowed us to think differently. And on that path, we became naturally more sustainable in many ways. So yes, we've been on this journey for a long time and we've been able to take sort of small and steady steps over many years. But if you haven't been on that journey, and this is all new to you, you may be feeling sort of overwhelmed or confused about where to start. Um, and, and as much as there are some uh, really good advantages to be had from this new era, there are also many perceived barriers to why people don't start on this transition. And these are things like we don't have the budgets, you know, the risk of investing in sustainable practices will be too high. Uh, you know, we're too busy, we don't have the time, um, we don't have the skills or resources. Or worse still, which uh, sort of goes back to Sam's uh, questionnaire earlier is, you know, it's not important for me or my business, so why should I bother? But in my opinion, everyone needs to bother and you need to get started. And I want to give you an example of how we started making change back in 2008 and the benefits we saw from that. So from day one, we reversed what was the most commonly used <laughs> terrible USP in our industry, and that was next day delivery. We stopped doing it. And we, and, and we did this by simply re-educating our customers. We provided them with the data and we highlighted uh, the negative impact in the supply chain that this was having. And then negative, uh, and the negative impacts were pretty obvious, but they'd just never been spoken about. So they were the cost of the fuel, you know, the staff time, packaging material, congestion on roads, pollution, vehicle emissions, et cetera, et cetera. But the positive benefits were vast to us and our clients by changing this practice. It drove, um, you know, internal, um, internal efficiencies for both parties. In turn, it drove down costs, which we could share with our clients. And it organically lowered our company emissions by 30%, even though we were still selling the same amount of stationery. And, and the best bit of this, we had really happy customers. You know, they felt engaged on our mission and they could see that we were thinking differently. And so that's just one quick example of the ob obvious benefits of uh, adapting a sustainable approach. But it does highlight how important it is when it comes to attracting and retaining clients and staff and how big, being more efficient uh, can save you money and save you time. And what we also learned is this, it produces a whole load of data and that data is what you can build your own story on. And finally for us, it meant we could compete on um, a whole 
whole new level, really, and a level playing field against our bigger competitors. Because as SMEs uh, or micro businesses, we're really agile. We can adapt really quickly and change course. And all of a sudden, the sustainability piece wasn't uh, about having a size advantage. So there are some bigger advantages to be had too, but in turn, they highlight some of the risk. And some of this risk is about future-proofing your business. So coming out of COP26, we know that by 2030, listed and financial companies will have to be reporting on their net zero plans. And whilst you might think that's an excuse for you to take your foot off the gas, we see it another way. Because actually the reality is, as these large companies need to comply with regulation, because it will be regulation, the small and medium-sized companies in their value chain will either have to adapt or they may lose the business. And you know we need to ensure we don't lose business. But if you have this clear sustainability plan in place, you'll be able to show your customers that they can trust you as a reliable supplier and count on you in the long run. And you will even attract more customers who are dropping their non-sustainable suppliers. And this shift is already happening. So how do you move forward to get these benefits? Well, I suppose it's important to remember that no one expects you to be perfect. And that is really, really important thing to remember. Um, and you can't do everything in one go. You know, in my opinion, we've been on this journey for 14 years and sustainability is a journey that never ends. It's also important now, as we were talking about earlier, uh, to enlist help, um, you know, and thankfully today there are loads of resources out there to help you do this. Um, we mentioned earlier the SME Climate Hub and there's other things like the Business Declare Network, which we're something involved in. But I think probably with the biggest words um, and the, the, the biggest recommendation I can give anyone is to take the B Corp Impact Assessment. Um, firstly, it's free, so that uh, takes out your budget problems. And there's no uh, obligation to become a B Corp at the end of it. You can dip in and out of it as you need and as time allows. And although you might feel uh, initially overwhelmed, it will give you a really good framework of what you need to do and where you can focus your energy and resources. And ultimately, it will give you the results of where your biggest impacts are. And I know time's short and I'm just gonna finish now, but I wanna put this all into real terms and what it meant for us um, on this long journey. Uh, in 2020, we won possibly one of the most prestigious tenders in the UK. And it wasn't because we had hundreds of staff or because we had a global reach or a huge turnover, because actually we had none of those attributes at all. It was simply because we were authentically sustainable. We had taken real action to measure and reduce. We certified and we verified our actions with evidence and we were transparent. And actually, it turns out that the client needed us in their supply chain to enhance their own net zero transition and commitments. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic, Adam. Thank you. What a great um, testimonial, and you know, it's 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 clear to see how that 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 journey went from the sort of panic, not knowing where to start, as so many people are at, to to now a very confident sense of how to do this and 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 and, what, and why this is so important to your your um to your bottom line as much as it is to to. The, the kind of values and that's I think that's a really important message um, we're going to go back into another breakout room now and, and um, inviting you to to keep thinking about um, the points that Adam's just raised there thinking about business advantage and opportunity for transitioning to net zero um, what do you think what do you what other main business advantages may there be are there things that um, we, we should be collectively promoting and talking about to to get businesses you know let's be honest the businesses in the room today and the people in the room are probably already pretty committed to this there's going to be a lot of people out there that aren't involved in this conversation yet at all so there is some more persuading that needs to be done and, and business advantage is a good way to go so you tell us um so this is the question what do you see as the main business advantage and opportunity for transitioning to net zero and Marie's going to put you back in the groups that you've uh, you've just been in and then we'll we'll um, we'll bring you back out in uh, in about six minutes and um and we'll hear what you thought so uh See you shortly. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. I hope everyone's managed to solve all this and uh, and we're all done. <laughs> um, that's what I'm banking on. <laughs> okay, so main business advantages. Steph, would you 
do the honours first again and let us know what your, your group uh, was concluding. Yeah, I'm just going to cover a couple of points because I think there was a lot more to discuss and a lot more to distill around that. But, um, you know, Sarah made a good point. She's, um, you know, she's working for West Sussex County Council, so um, not a business perspective, but obviously she's supporting businesses around this. But, um, you know, businesses are, are going to lose business if they don't if they don't catch on and they don't keep up with it. It's, um, you know, they'll lose tenders. You know, Adam gave a great example of winning a really big contract because of the ethos of their company being B Corp and, you know, everything they do around that. So, you know, they win contracts, but on the flip side, if businesses don't keep up, they will lose business. They won't be able to, um, you know, highlight their, their sustainability and, um, you know, their positioning around net zero. So ultimately they'll lose out. Um, the second one was just about the labor market, really. I think, you know, um, people want to work for companies that have this at the top of their agenda. So, um, you know, are they gonna be getting better talent? Um, you know move into businesses that it's it's high on their agenda so that was the other point we wanted to make thank you great so um absolutely there's there's, there's the general shift uh towards a just necessity and scrutiny but i think that's a really good point there around the staff we've got an employees market at the moment people are, are, are thinking very hard and, and carefully about where it is they want to work um and if if a company is willfully polluting and not doing anything about it then they're not going to get the staff that they need brilliant thank you um sam are you with us can i bring you in i, I hope so yeah uh, i hear you i hope i'm here <laughs> um I'll, I'll be as quick as i can to avoid getting cut off again um so really quickly yeah we had a great discussion um we talked about transport anthony works at big lemon and they see the opportunity of powering the low carbon economy with with low carbon transport infrastructure um, we heard from Tim, who has just come out of a meeting talking about the, the, la the massive lack of skill sets that we need to implement some of the net, net zero solutions, things like EVs, uh, home retrofits. So they're providing courses at their, their education centre to, to try and uh, acquire these skills. Obviously, that's a great business opportunity for an educational outlet as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and finally, yeah, we talked about um, mi mitigating the risks of the physical impacts of climate change. So, you know, the, the flooding in Germany that happened last year, which was quite frightening as a coastal area, was definitely not, you know, on the, on the bottom of the list of uh, an area that might actually in the future be quite badly affected by, by climate change. So mitigating that risk um, and, yeah, echoing the point that was just made by Steph as well, attracting talent um, through authentic purpose. Great. That was us. Thank you. And, and, and great to have... Yeah, organisations like Big Lemon as part of the conversation here today, reminding us that, you know, there are some pioneers in Sussex that have been been leading this conversation for a very long time and trying to do something about it for years. And we've got all of that expertise to to draw upon. Um, uh, so, you know, that's from a business as well as a political level. So that's great. Um, and also the point about the training, you know, seven million pounds just been invested into some of, some of the local colleges to to push around the, the green skills agenda and to to find new ways to to, to um, create courses. So um, if that investment's coming around that, you know, businesses need to take note because that's, that, you know, that, that, that can help them directly as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Caroline. <clears throat> Just really briefly, we talked about um, the B Corp and it being a business advantage, um, you know, strengthening the, the ethics and the values of an organisation, but also helping to recruit that talent, which is, um, you know, so difficult to get at the moment. Um, I think there was a little bit of concern, you know, there is a range of um, uh, standards coming through and, you know, uh, B Corp being one of them, ISO, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, you know, uh, are we going to see an explosion of that or, you know, is they're going to be some sort of standardization although recognize that they will be different for different companies um just um, really talked about, you know, peer pressure will actually, um, you know, so where you've got companies leading the, the way to reducing their carbon emissions, that will, um, you know, put peer pressure on other companies to actually follow suit. And, um, and, and we need to sort of maximise on that. And organisations need to be brave and look at themselves to reduce their own carbon emissions and also bring their supply chain along uh, with those conversations. So I'll leave it at that. Fantastic, thank you. And, and I think it's really important to recognise that, that the coastal West Sussex strip actually punches well above its weight in terms of B Corp uh, registered organisations. Um, you know, Higgity and Shoreham and, and the, the Body Shop and Littlehampton and obviously our friends Red Inc uh, here from Littlehampton as well. Um, you know, that's actually quite a high 
uh, concentration of B Corp compared to other parts of the country. So, so again, let's let's really celebrate that and and um, and and uh, and use that uh, local economic advantage. Brilliant. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you for for for, uh, for feeding back on that and for everybody taking part in that conversation. Um, we're going to move swiftly to uh, the question of innovation and collaboration, which has come up quite a lot today as two really, really uh, important points. Um, and so I'm going to bring in James Bailey, who, uh, as we heard earlier, has just opened an innovation centre in Brighton, um, looking at the future of concrete. Now, if anyone can make concrete exciting, it is James. Um, James, uh, can I bring you in? There you, there you are. Tell us a little bit more about how innovation is powering your net zero journey. 100%, thank you, Richard. Uh, I'm gonna talk about two different approaches to innovation, actually, and both of them have been helpful for us in coming up with some sustainable products. The first one is problem solving innovation. And that's probably the most familiar to us, especially in a construction industry, which is uh, unfortunately still heavily male dominated you know, men like nothing better than fixing something. Bob the Builder, can you fix it? Yes, we can. Um, there's a problem, go and solve it. So innovation to solve a problem is a very common way of, uh, of innovating. Here's a problem, go away and, and find an innovative solution. Um, perhaps slightly different model to innovation is problem seeking. So there isn't a problem, go and find a problem. In fact, go and find several problems and then you know, rank them in priority and then start solving some of those problems that you've, I've identified. Uh, in terms of problem solving innovation, one of our big clients, East Sussex Council came to us a few years ago and said, uh, James, when we, re when we resurface the roads, uh, there's a certain type of tarmac that when you heat it up and, and most uh, old tarmac gets heated up, recycled back into new hot tarmac, um, it's actually very hazardous to people's health. So, you know, what can you do to help us to recycle this, uh, this hazardous tarmac in a way that's not going to be harmful? Um, and we worked out that we could recycle it in a cold way and we could produce cold tarmac um, that was still full highway specification. And we, we, we developed that and launched that and everybody was really happy. Um, and we did that to solve the problem of the hazardous waste. At the same time, we were working with the, the Sussex University Innovation Centre and, and we thought, well, hang on a minute, if it's cold, it's probably got a better carbon footprint than hot asphalt. Well, what is that? And uh, we worked with them and the Carbon Trust and we understood that actually cold tarmac was 40% less uh, carbon footprint than hot tarmac. Well, that's great. 40% is a big number. The next question is, well, 40% of what? Um, and, and, you know, the answer was, you know, a tonne of tarmac is about 50 kilograms of of CO2. Well, okay, that doesn't sound great, but, and then what we did is we, we divided that by car kilometers because, you know, everyone drives a car and we found out that every truck, every truck full of tarmac had the same CO2 as 9,000 car kilometers being driven. I'm like, crikey, that's a lot. So yeah, 40% of 9,000 is definitely a really good saving to have. So we'd done the problem solving innovation. We were recycling this waste in a way that was safe and in a way that was uh, saving lots of carbon. Then we thought, well, hang on a minute, what's the carbon footprint of other uh, materials in construction? You know, maybe there's some that are even worse than, than tarmac. Um, and uh, we, we went out there on that problem seeking innovation and we stumbled across our good friend concrete. Um, and, and as Richard said, uh, we, 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 we've done some work on that. And uh, a, a single load of concrete, you know, one of these spinning drum mixer trucks that you see driving around everywhere at the moment, especially in Brighton and along the coast. Um, has got enough CO2 in there to drive 17,000 car kilometers. That's halfway around the world. So conference of the earth is only 40,000 kilometers. Um, and you know, imagine how many concrete mixes you see in a single day. So having identified a problem, we then went about to try and solve that problem. And uh, we came up with low carbon concrete that can cut that by 70%. Uh, it's readily available, bizarrely, um, it's cheaper, but rarely specified. Uh, so, so, you know, and, and again, just to put the kind of concrete figures into, into some kind of perspective, just 10 wheelbarrows full of concrete is the same as a flight ticket to Madrid. Um, you know, uh, that same concrete mixer, single concrete mixer, it would take at the Amex stadium, football stadium, full of mature trees two years to absorb that amount of CO2. Um, so I think, you know, when businesses are looking at their carbon footprint, they really need to look at embedded carbon rather than just simply sort of carbon that they are personally emitted 
uh, as they're driving around or delivering their stuff or running their running their factory. I mean, another great example is there's a, a big bus company in, in Brighton that's looking to introduce hydrogen buses, which is an amazing thing to do. Um, but they're, they're building a massive new depot with concrete um, and they're using traditional concrete to do that. So the carbon footprint of that new depot, the concrete in that new depot, is probably cancels the first five years benefit of having hydrogen buses and they've spent millions and millions to develop hydrogen buses so i think you know take a step back step away from the kind of consumer hype around energy transport and and really look at the as as uh, as um we discussed in our as paul mentioned in our group you know you've got to look for the biggest bang for your buck uh in a, in, a, in any particular in any particular sector um i think we you know just to sort of conclude really with, with regards to uh, certainly highways maintenance which is my sector uh, and civil engineering and building you know it, it is a sector that's heavily dominated by government spending highways maintenance obviously exclusively with west sussex council uh, east sussex etc uh, the district and borough councils uh, and, and and i'm really you know sad to say that 90 percent of the tenders we still get are 100 percent price only um, it's a very rare occasion that anyone puts anything about sustainability innovation. I think Southampton City Council needs deser uh, deserves praise. You know, they're unique in my view in their proactivity towards social value as well as, as sustainability. And with the best will in the world, you know, it costs money to have an innovation centre in Brighton looking at, at low carbon concrete and you can't always be the cheapest. Uh, construction is a very commoditized market and having a percentage for social value, a percentage for sustainability just means you can still win a tender even if you're two or three percent more than your competitor who does nothing who makes no investment in those areas so i think you know the, the absolute no-brainer would be for all districts and borough and, and, and county councils to introduce these criteria for any size of tender if that's too labor intensive i think they should put frameworks together and have two or three people on those, on those frameworks that are pre-selected based on their sustainability investments um, and, uh, you know, I think that would that would have an immediate impact and it would encourage and reward investment because sadly only I would say 5% of our customers are really giving us any credit for that. Um, we did benefit from a low case grant, which was which was really helpful. That's helped us to uh, progress the cold asphalt that we produce. Uh, so there is uh, there is help out there. But yeah, that's uh, a few thoughts from myself. Thank you very much, James. Uh, absolutely fascinating um as ever and I, and I think especially you know same with adam as well from from sectors that uh wouldn't traditionally be thought to be uh getting their head around this and and i think you know as you pointed out that a lot of the rest of the sector and a lot of the procurement isn't uh so it so it takes finding those problems and, and taking a punt and a few risks to to look at the uh you know rethinking it from all sorts of different angles um in order to to get to these new products so uh you know good on you um we were going to have another breakout room uh to look at innovation and um get you to think about that but i am conscious that we've got only about 10 minutes left and um you know we've we've had an extraordinary amount of uh input um from our experts this afternoon so perhaps if i just keep this as an open q a um, for the next six minutes or so um, before we wrap up at the end. Um, just for, if people want to put your hand up and, and, and join the conversation, ask questions of our panel, or maybe just make a, uh, a comment or a statement, um, that would be really, really uh, helpful. Um, Caroline, you've put your hand up, so I'm gonna bring you in first. I just want to take the liberty. I mean, James, you astounded me there. I had no idea that concrete was was such, you know, high carbon. <clears throat> How do we spread that message across then? You know, I mean, who are you talking to and what sort of networks and collaborations are you actually speaking to and how could we support that? Well, I mean, I've talked to the leader of the Liberal Democrats. I talk to everybody that will listen to me, to be honest, you know, um, Caroline Lucas, you know, but yeah, it's not, nobody's interested. I mean, we work for Highways England, um, and every month we have to send them a sustainability report and it's all about miles driven in our vans. You know, their latest campaign is absolutely bizarre. It's about idling time in our engines. Can you imagine? <laughs> and then not asking about the amount of concrete and asphalt used. It, it's absolutely a little bit bizarre. So, yeah, I don't know, you know, just pass the message on, you know, yeah. <laughs> single concrete lorry, you know, two football pitches of trees a whole year. 
it's 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 about getting the right people to 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 facilitate the conversation and to be to take it seriously isn't it and i think you know james you're a brilliant an ambassador for this and, and we did a whole you were involved in a whole event that we did with kent county council all about sustainable architecture concrete design the built environment the irony was that was commissioned by the culture team nothing to do with the planning team or anything like that you know it, it was all about um creativity and design not about the actual uh, decisions being made for planning so um yeah, I think, uh, you know, let, let, let's, let's keep amplifying these. But we've got an opportunity in January, as we've said, uh, to put all of these um, uh, key points forward to some of those key decision makers. Um, any other um, points or questions that you'd like to raise? Um, Jill, you've, put, you've made some great points in the chat throughout the, the, the session. Can I, can I bring you in to, um, to expand on those? Jill Sutcliffe? I'm trying to unmute. There we are. Um, there you know. <clears throat> well, I'm having to combat a lot of um, uh, unsustainable housing applications being made across both the coastal plain and Sussex in general. And one of my points, because the National Planning Policy Framework, which oversees, overlies the planning um, approaches, uh, mentions sustainable development and none of the uh, applications I've seen are using sustainable development. So one key way in would be to run a workshop for those planning departments that are ignoring it uh, and show the work you've done. Thank you, Jill. Um, James, if you want to come back on that. Yeah, we're very happy to do that. I think ultimately we're a small business and, you know, a bit like many of the people owners on this call, you know, we've got a wage bill to pay every month and we need customers and contracts and, you know, we're, we're not a lobbying or a PR organisation. And what we do is we naturally migrate towards areas like Southampton where they are, you know, giving this credit and we're winning more work and sadly we're losing more work further east along the coast, which is, you know, not what we want. But as I say, we've got the bills to pay really important point thank you and i think that's the same for for a lot of our speakers today you know this is this is a, a side uh passion rather than um you, you know necessarily that always with the nuts and bolts of running a business so how do we align those two better is what we're questioning today thank you, Can I say um, thank you. yes Joe, go. sorry i don't doubt that at all so get southampton to run the courses to demonstrate what they've been able to achieve to get the others to move how are they yeah. going to move if they don't understand what it's achieved? Yeah, good idea. This is a good question we can dangle to our our, our Sussex leaders in January. Why uh, why why are you not being a little bit more Southampton, perhaps? Um, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll see what the response is. Um, anybody else in uh, maybe time for one one or two short uh, other questions or, or comments? Anybody want to uh, add anything before we? we close um sam thank you for uh, addressing those earlier questions um that i know we we, we we couldn't do um verbally so that's uh that's very helpful um in the, in the chat bar if anyone has not seen that okay well then i'll i'll, I'll wrap up and to say that um you know the next steps as i as i mentioned is to uh, capture some of this conversation today and we're going to present some of it back to um, some key players from uh, from uh, um, uh, parliament and, and, and local authorities, uh, other strategic players, people looking at the next kind of wave of, of investment and so on locally so that they're hearing the, the business perspective which is really important. Um, and, uh, and, and these ideas exchanges will continue looking at um, uh, some other kind of knotty topics in more depth over the next 12 months. I know we're going to be looking at um, probably looking at innovation itself as a concept and what that actually means for small businesses. We've heard some great examples today, but there's a lot of a lot of businesses that, that 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 need that demystifying before they know where to start. And um, and there'll be some other conversations that we we hope that you'll join us for. You are probably aware that Andrew Griffiths, our local MP, is the minister for Net Zero. We are, we are. Yeah, so he's worth advising. <laughs> we, he's, he's, he's been invited in January. Uh, I don't know if he's confirmed, but um, I know we've got a very good response rate so far, so we are expecting to have 
Good move. People. Um, there'll be more details posted uh, on um, this event and on uh, the other events coming up on the Coastal West Sussex Partnership website. Um, you know, this is an ongoing conversation. It obviously doesn't stop here. Uh, so we want to make sure that um, you, you feel that you can contribute. Um, there might be ideas and thoughts that come out of this that uh you know you have in the shower later and you want to feed in please do uh, and and contact um the coastal west sussex partnership uh and uh, we'll make sure that that gets um fed in um karen's prefer andrew is attending so that's good andrew Griffiths, that's that's uh, that's good news um so just leaves me to thank very much uh, our speakers um i hope you'll you'll join me in the in a, a distanced round of applause um you know brilliant to hear uh from from Sam, from Zoe, from uh, uh, Adam and James, um, all doing extraordinary work. And thank you very much to the Coastal West Sussex Partnership for uh, enabling today to happen and to Steph and Annie Marie and my team for uh, all their sort of organizational work and bringing it together. But other than that, uh, wish you a very uh, happy rest of the week and um, we'll see you all again soon.